and anytime and available from anywhere and to any device. Formal and informal learning become more, more and more blurred. Institutions have to collaborate internationally at the same time as they are competing. And that is really a challenge. So that's the one of the reasons, that, that, that's the, why there are several reasons for needs for proactivism in a changing educational arena towards 2020 and 2030. At least in Europe, we are talking quite a lot about, um, I mean, 2020 is not that far far ahead, it's five, six years. If we really would like to do something, it is high time to, to change the educational system. And there are many uh, incentives for, for doing so. Um, can we just have a little bit of a chat where we are coming from? So I know approximately, can you just write which country you are from? Mexico, Argentina, US. Thanks. Great. So, uh, talking about some trends, why it is important to really take these uh, challenges on higher education and the changes, the uh, demanding changes. Uh, some trends is first of all, uh, there are some drivers. The, the, the demography is changing. We are more and more uh, going for globalization. The technology is changing and very, very fast developing. And also the labor market is changing. And also the labor market have interest and are stakeholders for higher education. And then we have the whole area of ICT trends. And just to mention some things, it's about data mining, uh, learning analytics, uh, 3D virtual words, uh, games, um, people, portfolio, open education resources, MOOCs, uh, augmented reality, etc., etc. And then nearly come new things every day which we have to cope with. And also there are need for, needs for new skills at the labor market. It's not just the skills about facts and knowledge. It's skills like uh, to take initiative, uh, to be responsibility, risk taking, creativity, team and networking, co-constructing, compassion, managing, organizing, metacognitive skills. A totally different kind of skills as was in the the skills for higher education, which we, we learned, was about content. But now as content is available everywhere, anywhere, all the time, there are other skills which are more important. And also people are nearly changing jobs uh, every five to seven years. That means, I mean, if you're educated as a nurse, you will not serve as a nurse for your whole life. Also there are new ways of learning. It's much more tailor-made more peer learning, and as I men mentioned earlier, anywhere, anytime, uh, teaching is much more blended with virtual and real combining. They're more focused on personalization and collaboration and informalization. Uh, this um, uh, image is uh, rather complex in one way, if you really go in detail on it. Uh, so as you can see, also there are different kind of skills. There are those personal skills, the social skills, the learning skills, uh, and much more about learner-centered, social learning, and life-wide learning. Um, the images from the IPTS um, uh, Research Institute, with, which serve for res research for the European Commission. And in one way, I would like this image so very much because, because it is so complex. But on the other hand, it is rather simple when you see it, to see why we have to change our educational system in many ways. Um, in September uh, 2013, uh, there was a new community from the European Commission, which is called Opening Up Education to Boost uh, 
innovation and creativity for the labor market in Europe to be competitive and to be more collaborative. And the Commissioner Vasilio, she has expressed it already in 2012, like, we must engage in a fundamental transformation of our education and training systems. And we need to fully exploit the potential that open and flexible education offers. And we really have to take the consequences, what it really means. Uh, so this uh, um, communication, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this communication, uh, yes, I'm coming to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, for next slide, here, um, and the European Commission stressed very much that we opening up education means bringing the digital revolution into education. Digital technologies allow all individuals to learn anywhere, anytime, through any device with the support of anyone. We can't. Uh, make education and, and offer education as we did before. It's my course, my students, my books, my content, my university. Because content is available from all over the world with OER and with MOOCs. We can use, take use of the best teachers around the world and to collaborate. And content is just a click away. Uh, I would like to, to stop here for, for a while. Um, what are your opinions about um, anywhere, anytime, to any device, and with the support of anyone? I see one comment here in the chat. Uh, let me see. There's not a challenge from e-learning that comes from. Um, I will uh, try to follow some of the chats. Yeah, trust, it says very much about trustable networks and that um, it's easier to learn when you trust somebody and when you see somebody. And that is very true because uh, learning is very much about just networking and, and about confidence and trust. And that's also the reason why we really have to uh, take the challenges with open learning and design our open online learning so we can build in trust and to build networking and to be visible for each other. Uh, I will continue with um, a recommendation for higher education for, from the European Commission with this initiative, which I mentioned, opening up education. I point out uh, seven very important uh, issues. And the first thing is that higher education need to review their organizational strategies. And that means also that maybe they have to reorganize their strategies and to reorganize what kind of office they have. Uh, we have a with the e-learning area I lived quite along with uh, those, those who are, who are enthusiasts for e-learning and open up education, but you need, need also to have um, organizational and management uh, support for it and to build an infra infrastructure for it and because that give, uh, gives us incentives for both the, the academics and for the, for the learners. Um, it is also expressed um, very, very clearly that um, we have to exploit the potential of massive open online courses. And we know already by now that massive open online courses, uh, each uh, letter is uh, negotiable. And we also know that there is a lot of new abbreviation like uh, NOOCs, for example, national open online courses, uh, books, uh, small uh, private online courses. And there is a huge arena of uh, variations. And um, that shows, I think, very clearly that this trend with openness very much is here to stay. And thus, we have to both be proactive about it and we have to adapt 
accept it and we have to embrace it. Um, we have to stimulate uh, innovative learning practices like blended learning. We also have to equip teachers with high digital competences and also learners with di digital skills and competences. Because quite often, at least for the, from the academic side, um, if uh, academics are using uh, technology, it's quite often that they use it for their own uh, teaching and, and presence, but not quite often uh, to, to use it for the learners, from the learners' perspective, so they can learn more deeper, more connectivity, more creative, uh, etc. Um, open, opening up education doesn't mean just mean um, open courses and open courseware. It also means openness about validation and rec for example, how do we validate uh, skills, uh, experiences, uh, knowledge, which um, uh, learners ha have uh, taken from maybe other courses, uh, other universities, uh, maybe even in informal settings. We're not very good at that uh, in higher education. Not even to recognize what they have done from one university to, to another one. But opening, opening up education is very, very much about validation and recognition. One very nice example about recognition is what I do with the Open, uh, Open Education Resource University. I don't know if you are familiar with that, but um, there are about uh, 20 universities around the world who are joining this Open uh, Education Resource University. And um, they, are, they just have courses with Open Education Resources, and learners can take courses from those, those uh, universities in the consortia, and then they can get to one of the universities and they get, get their degree. That is really about recognition. So, for example, students can take um, a lot of courses from prestige universities, very expensive universities like uh, Athabasca in Canada, um, but maybe they are staying in, living in uh, Africa or Asia or India or some, somewhere education is rather um, maybe not that expensive as in America, and then they can take the degree from the university in Ind India. But all the courses are maybe from Athabasca. That is just one example about recognition, which I think is very, very um, nice ex example. And then also to, to make high tier of open education resources and make it visible and accessible. Uh, some of the key trends from new media cons maybe you are familiar with uh, with this report which comes uh, every year. Um, this was just la launched, uh, I think, a week ago or ten days ago. The New Media Horizon Report 2014 for higher education. And what they stress very, very much is exactly what I've been talking about. We need to face uh, and embrace those new trends and the challenges on at least those three levels, on policy levels, on national level, at university le policy level, at department policy level, about leadership also in all the all um, kind of levels, and in practice. It is not enough to have just in practice or just in the teaching situation. So that means that we have to, that we are facing a, a, some kind of new learning and teaching paradigm because it in, really involves um, and how you are organized, how you are infrastructured, how you, what kind of policies you have, what kind of support you have, and how you are dealing with, with everything. Uh, they also said, uh, say that um, we need to challenge that there are competition from unexpected corners, and, the uh, and how does that uh, infect our business models? And there are also new models 
which education have to, to compete with. For example, um, the whole issue for, for with the informal learning, as I talked about earlier, and about how we, we recognize and validate uh, learning experiences. There are a lot of uh, scaling teaching innovations and to expand access and to keep education relevant. So we are living in a time where competition is rather um, high explored and that is the reason why we have really to collaborate because we need to be, um, I mean there are so many things to do and there are so many um, uh, competence and research which have which have to have to be developed and in research this is what very common that we need to collaborate but in education that hasn't been that far uh, exploit um, until now but as we have to compete we need to have new models for education we can't just um, fit in the old um, the old system we have had earlier. Um, there are some other trends as well, why we have to really look what we are doing and why we are doing things. There is a huge shift from students as consumers to students as creators. And that the students are really the, the central person and the central individual in the educational system. It is not organization you know, as such and the organizations offers, but it is the students' demands, the students' de needs, the students um, think about the quality because if students are not happy with something, they can just go to another university because universities are more or less open for everyone. So if something doesn't uh, fit them at one place, they go easily to another place. And also young people today are very mobile, both uh, virtual and, uh, and physical. and also to see students as collaborators. This is also a shift what you used to, to, to see that there is one or persons, one category of academics, they can more, the, more learn than, than the students and professors are better than ordinary teachers and it isn't like that any longer because we all have different kind of skills, different kind of knowledge, different kind of experiences and together it will work out fine. We also have to face more about online hybrid and collaborative learning. We also have to face that the rise of data-driven learning and assessment and we need to face agile approaches to change. We need to be rather flexible and that is not very easy and if we go back to this, uh, that, that image I showed from the beginning from IPTS there are different kind of, of skills which individuals, learners, all of us need to have today. And many of those skills are not really I, neither uh, uh, appreciated, maybe neither very explicit in uh, learning outcomes, for example, at universities, because their learning outcomes are rather uh, factor oriented. As there are need to be a dialogue approaches for change, we need to have a lot of um, different kind of mindsets. And then we have the whole uh, evolution of online learning and uh, the ecosystem of open learning. There are different um, there are different types of, of both the learning offers and the course offers and the learning styles and some. I mean, we have the whole variety from open education resources, for example, some people would like very high material, uh, another, some other people would like to have a bachelor or a master's degree or even a PhD or, so there are different layers of education nowadays which are really demanding because there are so many different target groups and I would really say that the new trend for education now is to, to really uh, face and embrace the, the, the situation with with the ecosystem of, of learning and learning offers. And 
And also, as Anneli had talked about earlier, that it is seeing it from the learner's perspective. The huge uh, difference is about engagement. Because young people today, if it's not uh, fun enough for them, or if they don't find it, uh, they it motivated, they just leave and go to something else. So how can you have the keep the engagement for the learning process and the motivation? So how can we how can we um, deal with the engagement in online learning environments, and how can we make it to be personalized? And I would like to, to make a stop here as well and um, discuss uh, some some thoughts you may may have uh, have so far. So how can we keep engagement for the learner during our courses or during our office from universities? Ubiquitous learning, as someone said already. Learning is a basic need that has to be free and open, yes. I think, yeah, I don't know exactly if there was about this comment, but someone wrote about networking, and that is also a very important skill nowadays that students already from from the beginning in, in their the studies need to build professional networks. But I will say that engage, engagement and motivation is one of the, maybe, I mean, it has always been being like that, that you need to, to be motivated and you should be motivated. But quite often in the learning system we have had already from until today is that it's organized more from the provider's point of view. We have this course, we have those offers, we have that and that and that. But now it is really more from the from the learner's perspective. And if, if the learners are not uh, engaged or if they don't like it, they just uh, go away to something which is better. And we also know from very much from research uh, that um, I mean the most uh, important is the internal intrinsic motivation for learning, not the external, not the grades, not the exams. Um, I'm going back again to the uh, New Media Consortium Horizon report. And they use also to list some, uh, tra some technology um, trends. And the, some of the trends are, have now been, list <clears throat> been listed to you in the last uh, two or three years at least. Uh, but they also do like that, that they, they said what will be the coming trend for the next year and then for the three, next three years and then for the next five years. And as I said, some of the trends have coming back um, um, many times already by now. Uh, but what was uh, what new? Um, okay, maybe not new, but um, they were. It was expressed in maybe a new, newer way, and that is about consumer technologies. What do a consumer need to have in a digital society? How can we learn about digital strategies? And how we, do we set up that in, in our educational office? And internet technologies, and learning technologies, and social media technologies. So I think uh, um, those uh, technology key emergings will really um, change, or really have to change the way how we are designing our courses and how we are side designing our learning activities. Uh, already for, for many years, uh, Gilly Salma, for example, um, launched uh, her book and her uh, research about activities. How can we 
organized activities so those those kind of things with digital skills can be enabled I think you are familiar with uh, Gilles Salmon's uh, book about that activities Um, so it is very much about motivation and emotion. We all know, I mean, it is what easy to just go to ourselves. If we really like something, if we are mot motivated and we have uh, some kind of passion and emotion for something, then we are willing to learn nearly whatever it is, because it ha have to come from our heart. So that is one, one, one of the reasons why the new models must uh, use these tools and services to engage students on a deeper level. And we also see that uh, those small kids, they are what is pretty soon in, in our universities and they are curious and they like to learn and they like to, to be motivated, they like to experiment about things. So how can we keep this uh, motivation uh, ongoing? So about motivation and emotion, how can we build in that in our learning processes? Um, it used to be said that some elements of the creative classroom um, need to embrace those issues about content and curricula, assessment, learning practices, teaching practices, organization, leaderships and values and connectedness and infrastructure. I mean, we have seen those um, dimensions for a long time and we are rather familiar with them. Uh, and they, they will still be there even for 2020 and 2030, but I think they will have totally different other colors. We have to repaint the content of it, according to what I have earlier said. We are also very used um, to talk about um, Bloom's taxonomy, about learning. I'm sure you are familiar with it, all of you, but um, I'm not quite sure that uh, maybe you are, but um, not at least all my colleagues at my university. Um, are so familiar with the digital taxonomy. And if you, uh, this is just one example, if you, you Google a di uh, digital taxonomy on the net, you will find a, a huge variety, I mean, more or less on the same theme, which this, this I have here. Um, but what uh, this one say is that um, um, it is divided into uh, analyze, uh, evaluate, uh, create, um, refer, understand, I mean all those steps which we are used to. Uh, this is an interactive one and it's very nice to play around with because um, if you, for example, are looking for how can you stimulate um, creative uh, ways of learning in something special, um, what kind of activities should you use and other special kind of tools maybe for how you can stimulate it. Um, so then you just uh, click on this wheel and uh, it will uh, play around, so it is rather funny. And I think uh, that is a totally new dimension, how we can see, uh, how we can, I mean, uh, embrace uh, motivation um, and um, emotions and uh, keep the, the enthusiasm for the learner to, to use different kind of activities, different kind of um, skills, different kind of um, activities, etc. And using that we can very much about, about this um, learning design uh, uh, scheme. Uh, learning design for 21st century, uh, we have always said we learn much in, in networks and there are so many different um, kind of tools, activities, um, and how we design our courses and how we design our assessments, how if we should have any assessments at all, I mean in the tra traditional way, 
which I will not plead for, but um, because there are some different uh, other ways. Uh, but uh, looking also at this um, at this image, uh, first we have a lot of different tools, and then we really have a huge network. So learning design have to be embraced in another, in another way. And that means that we need to have a new mindsetting in our learning and teaching processes. I would also like to argue for a more Rhizoman thinking and and Rhizoma approach for learning, because we are all very aware of that uh, learning does take place in a linear system, but that is exactly what our educational system is, uh, is um, designed uh, up until now at least. Everyone starts at one place at the same time and go to the whole path, but even if there are different kind of personalities, different kind of behaviors, different kind of demands, different kind of um, possibilities for each individual. Um, learning takes place in this uh, rather chaotic ways. Threads are coming and going and come together, etc., etc., and some grow and some disappear, uh, depending depending what the, need, the needs are. So I think uh, we need to have a more right some and uh, serendipity uh, approach to things. Uh, actually, right now I'm also I, I, I talked quite a lot about right some thinking in my dissertation uh, and on quality, but also right now I follow the the MOOC from um, Dave Cormier, who was one of the founders of the term MOOC at least, together with Stephen Downs and, and um, Siemens, and the course is about um, right some thinking. And the, the first uh, line on this course was, if you think there will be a curriculum, the, the course is, the course name is, the curricula is the community. And that is really what I like. <laughs> uh, because um, this, this is exactly how can we take use of the community for learning perspectives and how can we uh, be with rhythmatic and use the serendipity way of thinking and make that as a learning process and maybe also make it as a curricula. But um, we will argue that there is a difference between this linear thinking and the Rasom thinking, and it makes a difference. <coughs> Oops. <laughs> uh, so um, we need to transform, we need to rethink our educational system. And I will argue that there is time for change. And as I said in the beginning, 2020 is not that far ahead away. We are also very well aware of that um, kids nowadays are quite used with um, technology. It is said, uh, I don't know how it is in your countries, but it is said that um, nearly every second two years old child use internet and different kind of devices on daily basis. And those young people, they are coming to our universities in 2020, 2030. They have a totally different mindset. We already see that um, a lot of, I mean, that is maybe a, a new utopia, but in an, an extreme in one way, children today, maybe if they have a book, for example, um, they are starting to see if it can move uh, like uh, like they're doing with their mobile and the tablets. And they are, uh, even on the TV, TV uh, they are starting to, you know, see if it, something can happen a bit quick, quicker. <laughs> and that is maybe an extreme in one way. So, um, I would also argue that um, the paradigm that has worked for over a century is gradually becoming obsolete. obsolete. And for 2030, we need to op work more on open education. So I will stop here again, and um, um, I, I, I like this sentence very much, caring is sharing, sharing is caring, because that is everything what uh, open education is about, and we need to share, and we need to care about each other, and we need to care about our society and uh, our globe, and to use the 
total resources we have. And that's, that is why we need to have an open education for everyone. So I'm very happy again to take some um, questions or um, have a dialogue or see what is happening in the chat. Thank you very much. But if you could uh, using authentic material assistance. go through the chat very quickly. Uh, there are lots of comments. I don't see any questions except mine, but there are a lot of uh, comments. And that's what's great about the chat boxes, at least uh, for those who use them, that uh, you can kind of think your way through, you know, brainstorm, uh, reflect as you listen to a presenter. Uh, I saw two comments I would like to, to um, comment on. Um, there's one which has stopped here about risk takers. I think that is very important. And that is exactly also what it is about to be, have a serendipity uh, approach to things. And uh, also, I mean, we can't know everything from the beginning because we are living in a rather uncertain time. And things are happening very, very quick. So what is true today is not maybe true tomorrow. So that is also one uh, very important uh, uh, question why we need to have this um, this kind of different kind of uh, skills and mindsets. And I also saw uh, one comment about batches uh, and that was very uh, good that uh, some of you uh, talked about that because I think also that in very far ahead I think uh, the university's role, university's role have always been, um, I mean they are the only one who can make certificate and to, to make this uh, for, for learning processes. And I still think that this will be the case. Uh, be that uh, all the other things for will take place with in, in a content take place in in I mean all over the places. Uh, and I also think in one way that certification and accreditation will take place, uh, as one of you was saying, with with this uh, open batch uh, movement. Sometimes it will be the, uh, perhaps, uh, sorry, per perhaps it will be the, the employees who will um, certify if a girl or if a learner is good enough for that company. And that makes also that we have to build in our portfolios and uh, maybe the individual come to the working place and say, I have done that, this and this and this and that. I would like to work here, what you offer. And then the, the um, companies can make the, the the judge, is this person good enough or not? And I think that it will, is what we will see uh, more of further on. And also, as I said, uh, maybe you can take the old courses from different kind of places and then you come to the university and you pay for your for your degree. But you're not uh, taking the content from the universities, not a single university at least. So why have universities? I don't understand the value of universities, um, the way things are going. Uh, so Nelly, what, what was your comment? My comment is I don't understand the value of universities. Um, I, I don't see their purpose uh, for babies who are starting to use their iPads or iPads at the age of two, and I've seen this quite often. What value are the universe? What are they going to offer us? A certificate? Why will we need certificates in the future from universities? Yes, that is also the question. That is also the question. They are, I mean, the, I don't know in your opinion, but uh, in those uh, networks uh, I used to be in and those discussions I have, that is also very questions very much. Maybe universities will uh, maybe be, be, be full research and certification will even maybe be, be left from the university for, for open badges, for example. And we can also see that, I mean, we can see that with the, with the MOOC uh, movement, we can also see that with, with distance uh, learners, uh, for example, um, many, I mean, I mean, for years, many of the distance learners who have done distance courses 
they're not doing it for the certificate or for the degree. They're doing it because they would like to learn and because they're interested in the topic. And that is exactly the same with the, the learners who take MOOCs. They're not doing it for the certificate or for the badge or whatever they get for it. They would like to learn. They would like to know something. And that is good enough. So uh, I, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, maybe people would like to have a PhD or something to, to go in for research, but that is something else. And then maybe the degree courses, um, but I I'm not quite even sure for, for bachelor, for example, but um, maybe for, for a PhD. PhD research based. But I hope it will change because, I mean, it is uh, finally it is uh, what people are doing and what people are performing and um, what kind of work uh, come out, which is uh, the important and uh, not what kind of uh, degree or certificate you have. Yeah, well, that's the problem today. There are lots of people with degrees and they can't get jobs. They have their, you know, post-grad grad degrees, their MAs, and they can't get a job. Yeah, that's right. There are a lot of academics who are unemployed. And whether it's maybe, um, I mean, maybe not, I mean, a lot of academics are employed, unemployed. They have a they have used a lot of time, they have used a lot of money, both from the, from the society, and they can't even get a job. And sometimes uh, even uh, companies say that it would be better if you haven't uh, have this um, this degree because um, you, you, we need we need to we would like more to tailor made the dedication we like to have in our company. I think that will be more and more that the company is uh, and the entrepreneurs and the, I mean the society are very, very large stakeholder in the educational system. And I think we can see that much more also that, at least in many universities board, there are stakeholders from, from industry, from labor market, etc. cetera, um, to cooperate what kind of offers universities shall have or should have or how you can develop uh, courses or learning possibilities. And I think we will see that much more in the future. Yes, overqualified. A lot of people are overqualified. And uh, I think uh, many companies would like to, I mean, we have already had that for a long time, also for commission-based uh, education, for example, that companies buy from the university because they would like to have a whole group educated. Because if you have the, a whole group, you can see also some development at the, in, the, in the company instead of just um, you send persons for different kind of individual courses because that doesn't mean that the, the company or the working place will develop. I think that will also be a change because it is much more, more about doing together and to collaborate, which, which counts. How to engage without badges? Yeah. It's again, I think, very much about intrinsic motivation. Of course, uh, some some people are still very more mot motivated if uh, someone else said, "Oh, you are very good, Abba," or "Oh, you are very good." Uh, instead, that I can maybe feel, or if I did bad or good uh, in, in situations. But I think also about this is very much about learning design. How can you build in internal motivation and internal trust and confidence in your learning processes? That is the reason why I think we have to rethink uh, so much in education because we need to have this uh, different kind of mindset. It's a challenge, uh, task we have ahead, I think. Uh, Eva, thank you so much. Is the fact that you're allowing us to um, to think in between uh, your words. And I think this is really, really important and is generally done online. I think um, Anderson mentioned this a while back, the value, he wrote a paper and I think he was trying to write a book too on these virtual classes and the value of having stops, you know, having these pauses and not just, you know, speaking, spe you know, speakers speak, 
but they don't always allow their audience or their, you know, their participants to stop and think. And what you're doing is you are allowing us to think. And uh, I commend you for that. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was an excellent presentation. Um, a lot of food for thought. And I think that's is what going to move us forward. The fact that we can think, stop and think and decide how we're going to go. Very important. Are there any questions or comments? Helena says very important. She's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think that is also something which is, um, I mean, I think there are too little time for own reflection mm -hmm. in education today also. Because, I mean, it is really when you reflect yourself when you, or when you, when you talk to other people, it is those situations where you learn a lot. Exactly. Yeah, it's building together and that's where the networking and the social, the social aspect of learning comes in when, when you can sit, but sitting is limited yeah. because you're not, how many, how many people can you sit with? You can't sit with the world, but you can sit with the world in a virtual classroom like this. I mean, literally we can have uh, thousands and thousands of people live, but most people prefer for some reason to watch the videos. You know, thousands of people join, but only uh, a few actually come to the live session. So this is something that I'm wondering about because there's a lot of value in the live online sessions. You can't use the chat if you're watching a recording. But that is also the reason, I mean, <clears throat> uh, someone said it in the chat also, I mean, we have to build it trust. And in online teaching, we really need to think what we are doing and how we are designing the, the, um, the environment so you can build in trust, so you can build in chats, uh, talking to with other people, how you can build in reflections. I mean, there are so, there are so many things you can do in, in the online environment which we maybe are not thinking of um, many people are thinking about, about it or we make a recording of a, of a lecture and that and put it online and that that's it but if you really and that is also why, why for example this initiative from Europe uh, really says that it is not just about how to use technology for your for teachers and for academics but really how can you use it in in the learning process so that the learners can take use of all the advantage because we don't um, use the, we don't exploit the technology uh, in that way we which it can be used so that's one of the reasons why i think it's so important to really think about learning design uh, yes online education is very popular in europe i will say yes what about your country, Halina? Not so much. Hmm. I think um, I really love uh, to continue this kind of discussion and maybe I don't know if, we're, if there are chat possibilities so uh, you're very welcome to discuss with me further on. You have my uh, contact details uh, and Nelly will know where, where I am. <laughs> so it was really nice to be together with, with you for a while. Thank you. Thank you, Ebba, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, the recording will be available very soon. In addition, I'm recording this uh, and we'll be adding it to YouTube and Vimeo. You'll also be able to go back to uh, the WizIQ area and um, course area and continue the discussions. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow, and not tomorrow, we'll see you on the 15th. 
because as I said, um, tomorrow's session was postponed to February 24th. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. And you've got all the information that you need. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing bye -bye. you at the next MOOC. <laughs> thank you. Join us. Join us in discussion, bye -bye. Eba. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now.